Well, it's that time of the service where we get into the Word of God, and I trust you're ready uh, to go, that you're prayed up, that you're prepared for what God has in store for us. And uh, each week, uh, we send out uh, the video, and uh, people get to be at home, those who aren't yet ready to come out to church. And so we welcome you by video today, to all of you that we cannot see uh, face to face, we miss you, and we are grateful that you are watching by video. We thank God for the technology that enables us to do it. People like Kyle and Gail and others who are involved in uh, making this happen, we are grateful for that. We are continuing our series, A Portrait of a Healthy Church, trying to get a big picture of what a healthy church looks like. I believe with all my heart I cannot chase after that which I cannot see. So if I can't see it, if I can't imagine it, if I can't get that picture in my mind's eye of what a healthy church looks like, I'm not going to invest in chasing after it. And so this series, I believe, is so important to us here at Schroyer Road as we seek to go to the next level of church health. I've entitled the message this morning, a healthy church loves one another. And even as we uh, came in uh, to church early this morning, uh, so many uh, came up and just welcomed my family here. And I, I have sensed from the very beginning that Schroyer Road has a real strength in this regard. That doesn't mean we don't have room to go to the next level. But what I'm saying is thank you for your love for God and your love for one another. And we find in the scripture that loving one another is really a mark of a healthier church. And so, praise God for those things that uh, we're doing well. We praise God for that. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and follow along as I read. Do you believe that the people that reside next door to you, uh, work next to you at the workplace, go to school with you, and live in this secular world, fully understand Christian love? It's been my experience that there's lots of definitions of love and a lot of misunderstanding about love. And chapter 13 gives us a rich understanding of it. Usually we hear this text preached only at weddings. That's interesting because weddings really had nothing to do with this text. But I have preached it at weddings because uh, what is said in this text also has application to marriage and to how we are to love one another as a husband and wife, but that's not the context at all. In fact, the context is it's tucked between chapter 12 and chapter 14, which is dealing with spiritual gifts and is largely dealing with the gift of speaking in tongues and is addressing the problem of speaking in tongues in the Corinthian church. You see, the Corinthian church had lots of problems. Uh, they were worshiping in ways that were bizarre, and in ways that really dishonored God rather than honored Him. And so tucked between these two chapters on spiritual gifts and the abuse of them is this beautiful love chapter where God is challenging His people to seek love. Let me begin in the verse right before chapter 13. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give all I possess to the poor, and I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind. And now we see but a poor reflection. As in a mirror, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Father, we pray that as we open your word today, that your spirit will take it, and as Greg said, that this word will be alive in us and able to penetrate and change us from the inside out. That I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. John 13.35 says it better than anyone. The words of Jesus, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How will the world know that we who call ourselves Christians are indeed saved, transformed, and different from anything else they see? They will know that by knowing and seeing and experiencing the love that we have for one another. I have to confess that I have been deeply disappointed as I've seen my brothers and sisters on Facebook um, at odds with one another, uh, adopting a critical spirit, and really uh, I, I have to confess that I believe uh, the church in America today is more deeply divided than I have ever seen it in my lifetime. And we can blame the pandemic, but the pandemic only reveals the heart. We can blame the uh, government, <laughs> we can blame uh, the political season we're in, we can blame all kinds of things, but it's really a revelation of the heart, and it should deeply sadden us. It's time to come back to Christian love. And it's not just love for people who dress like me, talk like me, and think like me. But it's love for those who may be very different. You know the umbrella that we label Christian is a big umbrella. You know there are people under that umbrella that are not Baptist. They're not white. They don't live where I live. They don't do what I do, necessarily. It's a big umbrella. It is by grace, through faith, that we are saved. It's not by being a Baptist. It's not by being white. It's not by being like Steve. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. That's a powerful truth that we need to really grasp 
this morning as we think of love. The first point I want to make this morning is that Christian love is of great value. Never underestimate the power of Christian love. Back to that verse right before chapter 13. I will now show you the most excellent, the most valued gift of all. Just as he's been talking about all uh, the variety of spiritual gifts, helping, mercy, teaching, leadership, administration, uh, hospitality, mercy, all these things, but of greatest value is love. That's what he's trying to teach the Corinthians. Instead of desiring what everybody else has that you think is better, strive for love. It's the most excellent way. And then the very last verse of chapter 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest, the most highly valued, is love. So the love chapter is sandwiched between the most excellent way and the greatest of these. Isn't that beautiful? Now that's beautiful at a wedding. But it is absolutely critical within the context of church life and church health. The Corinthian church was an unhealthy church. We don't want to be like that. When I hear people say, I want to be like a New Testament church, you know, what do you mean? Uh, you know, take your pick. I mean, there's a variety of experiences here. And some of those churches were healthy and some were not. I don't want to be like the Corinthian church. I want to value love in the body of Christ. So whenever you welcome a newcomer, you, you are expressing, you are expressing church health. You are manifesting the Spirit of God within you in giving Christian love to others. You know, we have talked uh, much about reaching uh, our community right here around the church. Uh, multicultural community. Multi-generational community. And it's going to be critical that we continue to practice love as a great value because I tell you what, People need that. And, and people need it whether they know they need it or not. And they will know it when they see it. You know, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to articulate. What is Christian love? Well, I know it when I see it. I feel it. I experience it. I understand the theology of it when you give it to me, and the same when I give it to you. Now, love can be expressed in a variety of ways. Some people are introverts, some are extroverts. Some are huggers, and some are handshakers. And none of us are any of that during this pandemic. So it makes the expression of love much more challenging. But guess what? Love is in the eye. Love is in the body language. Love is in the voice and words. Love is in the kind action. And so even if I have a mask plastered to my face, I can express Christian love. Even if I'm a Swedish male <laughs> who grew up in kind of a stoic, reserved culture. I can give Christian love. See, it's not defined by how the world defines love. 
You know, you know one thing that amazes me about how the world understands love? Love is, you have to show me the way I want you to show me. And if you don't show it the way I want it, it's not love. Well, I'm not the definer of love. God is. And you can love me any way you can, as long as you love me. What? I've had people say, well, I'm just not a hugger. I just, I, 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 I'm not that kind of person. I have a real hard time. Well, you do, you do it the way you do it. That's okay. Because I will know it when I see it and experience it. Well, Christian love is of great value. There's no doubt about that. It's so important to the life of the church. Christian love has very unique qualities, very different than secular love. Let's go down through the list. I'm not going to, I could preach a sermon on each one of these, but let's just touch them quickly. Love is patient. I am not. But love is. And so, expressing Christian love is not to rely upon my own human default, but rather to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit within me. The Bible says one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. I can control myself under the power of the Holy Spirit. So if I'm not naturally a patient person, I can trust the Holy Spirit to help me be patient. And as I'm patient, I am showing Christian love to those around me. I tell you what, I'm a lot more patient today than I used to be. I don't know about all the grandparents. Um, you know, by the time you become a grandparent, you're much more patient with the little ones. And, and yet you can't go back and kind of redo that with your own. But I, I kind of sometimes wish I, I used to be more irritable. Now I'm more patient. I wish I was patient then. But God's sanctification is a process. It's a process of growing us. And we ought to be able to see those changes in our life. Love is kind. My son Steve uh, uh, used to say when he would hear of trouble between people, whether it was in the church, whether it was in the government or whatever, he would say, why can't people just be kind? And, and you know, it sounds like an oversimplification, but that's great theology. Really. Why can't we be kinder to one another? If I have the Holy Spirit within me, I can show love to you by being kind to you. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. You know, now people can, in the privacy of their own home, without ever sharing their own words, they can just post a meme and be absolutely rude. They can tell you what they think of a politician, a school teacher, a friend, an uncle, simply by posting a rude meme. Don't you sometimes just want people to have enough courage to look you in the eye. Don't hide behind a computer screen. If you really believe that, if you think that, then let's have a conversation because I don't want to be like that. Love is not self-seeking. We live in a selfish world. If you look at Second. Timothy chapter 3, the first five verses are a description of what it's going to be like in these last days, in the terrible times, right before Christ returns, and those descriptions in chapter 3 are summarized with this word, self-centeredness. 
The world is going to become increasingly focused on me as we get closer to the coming of Christ. We as Christians ought to have the quality of love for one another. That is described here in this text. It is not self. It is not about me. I, I think from a theological standpoint, the most significant point of theology that God has driven home to me over 40 years of ministry is that it's not about me, it's never been about me, and it won't be about me. It's about Him. We, we, we have to come down out of the ivory tower. We have to come down out of the pedestal that we have created for ourselves and realize that the Bible, the church, Jesus is all about Him. It's not about me. Christian love is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong doesn't hold a grudge. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. People fail. People disappoint. But we saw the love of God expressed in Jesus coming to earth, dying on a cross, rising from the dead, standing as an intercessor on our behalf because He loves us. And that was true yesterday, it's true today, and it will always be true, it will never fail. Other things will fail. But this kind of love never fails. Well, those are unique qualities. Are they at play in your life? Do others around you see those things in you? Thirdly, Christian love is a necessity. There are many things in life that are luxuries, Christian love is a necessity. You need it. And we go back to that verse where Jesus spoke in John 13, by this all men will know. Without this they will not know. This is a necessity. You can have beautiful buildings, you can have wonderful people, you can have great music, you can have preaching and all the rest. But if you don't have Christian love, the world won't know that there's a Christ who lives in you. Your love for others is a manifestation of the reality of God within you. We're a small group, aren't we? And yet, in this small group, the world can know that there are disciples of Jesus Christ. You don't need 5,000 people to express Christian love. Where two or three are gathered, these qualities can rise to the surface and the neighbors can understand that in this place there is something genuine there is something godly. There is something that I want. And it's different than the love, perhaps, that we've been taught. It's certainly different than the love expressed by Hollywood producers. It is a quality of life that makes all the difference in the world. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew chapter 22. Over the last
last number of weeks I've talked about the great mission of the church to go and make disciples. Here is the great commandment of the church. Matthew 22, starting in verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first, and it is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so we have the great mission of the church to make disciples intersecting with the great commandment of the church to love one another, to love God, to love others outside the church. And when those two great commandments and missions intersect, we have a healthy church. I can go on mission from morning to night, day by day, until the day I die, and I will accomplish nothing if I have not love. I can love you with all my heart, but if I'm not on mission, I will accomplish nothing. The church can only be healthy when we are at the intersection of these two great things. Schroyer wrote, Love God. Love your neighbor. Love one another. Schroyer Road, go. And as you are going, make disciples of all nations. And I believe as we do that, God is about to do amazing things. For that's who He is. That's His nature. He is a God that parts waters. He is a God that provides food in the desert. He is a God that heals the sick, and causes the blind to see. God is a God who transforms a shy boy into a preacher man. God is a God of amazing things. But it takes love on mission for Christ. Will you join me in that journey? And it's an exciting journey because we never know what's around the next corner. Are you okay with that? I am. We don't know uh, when the vaccine is going to come. We don't even know if it's going to work. We don't know if this thing is going to disappear in a month or a year or two. We don't know what's around the next corner. Uh, I believe God wants us in that posture because I believe He's capturing our attention in ways He otherwise would not. I believe maybe some are listening who haven't listened before. Does God have your attention this morning? Because God wants to do amazing things tomorrow. Let's pray.